Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm very excited uh, to welcome you again back to our uh, joint Broad and MIT EECS colloquium, which is hosted by the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center and AIND uh, within MIT EECS. Um, so for the ones who have already joined us a couple of times, um, you know that, you know, we're here very excited to feature speakers who really take, you know, this two way street between um, the computational sciences, machine learning and the biomedical sciences of bringing machine learning technologies into the biomedical sciences to answer important questions there, but also the other way around um, to use biomedical applications and questions uh, to really fuel the development of novel um, foundational developments in machine learning. And so I'm very excited to have uh, David Baker here um, to, to uh, talk to us today. So David is a professor of biochemistry and the director of the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, he's also an HHMI investigator and adjunct professor in many different departments, which also shows you how he's using uh, many different fields to come together um, to, to answer important questions and also contributing there um, to foundational developments. Uh, so that's in the departments of genome sciences, bioengineering, chemical engineering, computer science and physics. And as we all know, David pioneered the use of you know, computational um, methods um, to predict and design the, um, the three-dimensional structures of proteins. Um, in particular, his group has developed Rosetta algorithm, um, which I'm sure all of us here are very familiar with, um, for ab initio um, protein structure prediction, and then has used this in many different applications uh, to design new experimental cancer therapies, vaccines, nanomaterials, and much more. So for his work, um, David um, has been, uh, you know, recognized with many, many different awards, um, including the 2021 Breakthrough Prize, uh, the Wiley Prize, uh, and most recently also the Frontiers of Knowledge Award. And he's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So I'm really, really excited um, to have David here uh, with us uh, today. Um, so David, uh, the floor is all yours. All right, well, thank you very much for, for the introduction. So yeah, so I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, it's very much, I think in the theme of this, um, this series, uh, um, talk about how machine learning is really uh, transforming um, the area of protein design. And so I'll start off by giving you a few examples of protein design using um, uh, physically based, uh, physically based model, uh, the Rosetta model. And that's sort of based on kind of modeling all the interactions between the atoms in, in a protein and trying to design sequences for which the desired state is, has the lowest energy. And then during the second part of my talk, I'll, I'll show you how uh, deep learning methods are really kind of revolutionizing uh, all of this. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, and I apologize to, to those who, who heard me talk at the repeat, uh, the, the retreat, um, the road retreat, because some of this, uh, some, I, I've tried to put a lot of new stuff in, but but there will be some things that are the same. So I just wanted to say that one of the problems that we have gotten quite good at over the years is given a protein structure and a site on that protein structure, design a protein which binds with high affinity to that. And uh, one of the first problems that we applied this to was the coronavirus, which is shown in, um, the receptor binding domain is shown here. So we've designed um, a variety of small proteins to bind to it. They bind very tightly and they bind exactly as they were designed to bind. And, um, uh, and, and we've done this, as I'll show you, for, for quite a large number of different proteins. Um, one of the things that's nice about designing small proteins is that then you can have do a, a second round of design and, um, and, and uh, to position the little binding domains um, just where you want them. So this is, um, this is that one of the binding domains I had on the preceding slide, this little thing here. All of this is the spike of the coronavirus. And then we've designed this trimer here, which holds three of these um, uh, little binding proteins in exactly the right orientation to engage uh, three copies of the receptor binding domain. So as you'd expect, this sort of, this kind of three on three fit leads to very, very high um, avidity binding. And this compound neutralizes every strain against the, of the coronavirus, which it has been tested against. And it will be starting clinical trials um, uh, within the next nine months. And we're basically as a nasal spray, these design proteins are super stable. So you can, what we're aiming towards now is um, a single spray that would incorporate not only this protein, but um, antivirals against other respiratory uh, viruses, um, uh, flu, um, respiratory syncytial virus, 
and MERS, all of which we've done similar things and made very high affinity binders to. So um, that would hope, hopefully help both for sort of, uh, um, you know, endemic virus as well as pandemic viruses. Um, let's see, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so um, we've made binders now against a very large number of, of even cell surface proteins. And uh, now the really interesting thing is um, designing things that are designing reagents which are analogous to what I showed you in the, this trimer for the for this spike. Now we can bring together different receptor subunits in different valencies and geometries. And what we find is that we can get um, uh, a wide variety of signaling responses. There's less, um, that, that, that's more biology than, um, than computation. So I, I left this out, that out of this talk, but I think it's a really exciting opportunity now to make, um, make uh, signaling molecules that, that signal in either much more, def much more um, focused ways than naturally occurring um, uh, 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 signaling molecules, as well as ones that elicit new signals. Um, so in addition to being able to design proteins that bind to um, uh, folded protein targets, we've made a lot of progress in designing proteins that bind to flexible protein targets. And um, one very interesting class of those peptides are those that form um, amyloid fibrils that are um, uh, uh, involved in, uh, are implicated in neurodegenerative disease. So the basic idea here is to um, design a protein which um, has basically an empty slot for, um, uh, for the um, for the peptide, which is shown in yellow. So this would be the amyloid peptide. And so we've designed quite, and then it sort of fits in in the middle here. And I'm gonna come back to this towards the end of my talk. Um, in, and this is sort of a, a, a kind of one of the take home messages is that, you know, we spent a, a number of years designing these, um, these um, mechanisms for carrying out a, a particular biological function. Uh, in this case, um, Binding this uh, extended uh, beta a beta uh, peptide, you know, crafting the the overall fold so it would be appropriate for that. Now with the deep learning sort of generative models, this sort of solution comes out comes up without um, uh, without needing to precisely uh, program it. So this, this here's some experimental now data now um, on the a beta peptide, which if you put it in solution, it very uh, rapidly aggregates. Um, whereas if you add this, um, this design protein, it captures the peptide and, and, and prevents aggregation. And that's shown down here. And this protein also protects cells from uh, the adverse effects of, of amyloid fibrils. Um, so um, there, uh, there's a, 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 an interesting and general problem of, could you design proteins that can recon recognize any short peptide uh, in a modular way. And uh, Kei Jia Wu has been working on this problem. And so, and basically the idea is any repeating peptide sequence will trace out a superhelix. Um, and if we, and what she's done is design proteins, which are shown in these cylinders, which map out the same superhelix and have pockets in them for binding um, uh, each of the amino acids in the peptide. And doing this, she's been able to make binders for a number of different peptide sequences. When she's not quite at the level yet of being able to design binders for any peptide sequence, uh, but we're, we're getting a lot closer. Um, and this just shows designs and binding data for a variety of, of, of peptides. Now, the other application of these proteins that's kind of neat is they're disordered proteins which are involved um, in, in many cellular processes. And, um, um, and uh, it is it's been very hard to target those with small molecules because they don't really have folded structures where the small molecule could fit into. But um, with uh, with this with her designs, she's able to target regions of these dis disordered regions, and essentially, it's kind of like in that beta strand case I just showed. The um, those regions, uh, they basically they, they they when they bind the the, the binding protein, uh, they adopt the conformation that that we're targeting. So there's sort of first an ordering step and the binding step. And so um, uh, Cage has been able to design proteins that when you uh, pull down from a complex cell mixture, basically an entire cell lysate, you specifically retrieve the target protein and the other proteins it's in complex with, um, which I think is, is gonna really help in the characterization of the biological functions of disordered proteins. Yeah, one of the, the recent things which um, 
is so recent I, I didn't mention it at all in the in the my talk a few months ago is the de novo design of DNA binding proteins. And so you're all familiar with uh, CRISPR Cas9, um, you know, big big protein that requires a guide RNA for specific recognition. And uh, Cameron Glasscock and Robert and Ryan have developed a general method for being able to target um, specific DNA sequences. And so basically, the idea is to design a whole range of scaffolds which. Um, sit in the, in the major groove in just the right way to enable the side chains to carry out um, specific uh, DNA base recognition. And um, uh, on the right, you see, you see binding data and the targeted residues are the ones shown here. And basically the colors indicate this experimental data show you how much of this binding signal is lost when those residues or bases are substituted. Um, and so you can see that uh, these, um, uh, these these targeted uh, bases are are very specific. Um, so uh, uh, so it's really neat. We're we're now trying to test these in cells, but this would give rise to give enable a whole new way of of targeting specific sites with really very small proteins compared to what you need with other um, DNA binding technologies. Um, and uh, so in a um, a very nice experiment with. Uh, Luca Gordon's lab, uh, uh, Cameron uh, tested um, uh, the binding specificity of, of um, one of his designs against all seven residue, seven base uh, uh, DNA sequences. And it was very gratifying to see that, the, um, that uh, his, his design binds more tightly to the, uh, targeted, um, the targeted motif shown here. Um, and so now we're very excited, of course, about making synthetic transcription factors receptors, uh, repressors, and other DNA modulating enzymes using this. Okay, so on a totally different topic outside of medicine and uh, beyond proteins and DNA, um, we can design proteins that bind small molecules. And one of the things we're really interested in is, is light harvesting. And so here, um, uh, Nate Ennist has designed a protein which holds two chlorophyll molecules in exactly the arrangement that they have in the special pair in, in uh, in, uh, in the photosystems. And so the, it turns out the two chlorophylls are exotonically coupled and um, he and Shunji uh, Wang have built these into these um, assemblies, which uh, you see here. And there's two chlorophyll molecules binding per, um, per edge of this cube. And uh, so we're now trying to build larger light harvesting assemblies in this way with, um, uh, with ideally uh, a water splitting or other chemical, uh, other recipient of that, um, of that energy in the center. Um, so a, uh, a, a, a sort of also on the materials front, um, uh, Shunji Wang and uh, Zhe and uh, Una Natterman um, Zhe Li have, have designed, um, worked out a general way of designing protein crystals now, of course, there's huge numbers of crystals in, in, um, that protein crystallographers have developed over the years. And uh, what they have done is to um, work out a way to specifically program them. So they're designing very specific protein crystal lattices, and then they make the proteins, and they form crystals, and then they can solve the structure of those crystals. And the uh, design structures are very similar to the, um, to the uh, observed structures, which is really neat. And I'm showing you, showing, showing you three examples here. Uh, another problem, which is uh, really important in biology, is um, or is, are, are is designing proteins that are channel have channels in the center that can cross membranes. And uh, we've been making a lot of progress on this problem recently in collaboration with the lab of Anastasia Vorobieva, who developed these methods in the first when when she was a postdoc in my lab, and now is connect con continuing in her old lab in Belgium. So this shows a crystal structure of protein with uh, with a uh, um, uh, a de designed um, design model with pore. And um, we, what we're finding now is that uh, we can design proteins with very specific conductances. Uh, there's an example shown here. And um, uh, the, um, uh, what's neat, we can design proteins that have big pores and they have large conductances and proteins with small pores and they have much lower conductances. And now there's a lot of excitement, exciting opportunity for developing uh, sensors and detectors by putting binding domains to, um, to uh, 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 so that the, the signal can be modulated. We have some very exciting results on that um, already, which I, I didn't conclude. Okay, so if you are not a protein person um, uh, and you're a computer scientist, you probably 
get, you may be tired of looking at proteins. They, they look horribly complicated and all that. And um, that's, uh, that was the thing that sort of made structural biologists or, you know, the first crystallographers who studied proteins kind of throw up their arms in despair. But um, that is no longer necessarily has to be the case. Um, uh, for, for building things, you would like, like things that are really much simpler, things that just go straight or turn at defined angles. Um, and so Tim Huddy had this idea of making very regular proteins. And uh, so here you see um, proteins which are um, uh, perfectly straight. You can make them longer or shorter by cutting off repeat units that, they, that, go, that can do 90 degree turns, can be curved like this. And um, turns out that these work really well. So here are, here's some experimental data. This is a crystal structure of this straight block and it's nearly identical to the design model. And then if you put some of the, uh, these curved things together, you can get circles as shown here. This is just raw uh, negative stain EM of, of this protein. And if you change the curvature, you can get larger circles as shown here. And you can go into three dimensions by combining uh, the curved blocks to make this kind of ring with um, what Tim calls handshake blocks, which bind each other at defined angles. And by changing the angle at which they bind, uh, uh, Tim can make different shape structures as shown here. And um, uh, these are cryo-EM structures. So they come out almost identical to the design model. The easiest one to understand is this one, which has this flat um, uh, stru uh, structure with fourfold symmetry, these four arms coming out. And then there's this right angle handshake here. And when those are put together, um, uh, uh, Tim gets these uh, really beautiful cubes. Now, since everything is straight, just like if you were building a building or building a box out of, um, out of lumber pieces, you can just make the pieces longer. And, uh, and that's shown here. And they're getting longer and longer and the cube is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, Tim can also make uh, unbounded structures by taking these straight blocks, which generate this sort of structure and these um, uh, these sort of blocks here, and then you get these ladder-like structures he calls train tracks. And again, uh, he can modulate the length of the spacing between these and the length of the length this way just by changing, by lengthening or shortening the blocks. And here's, uh, here's the, the, some of the rings I showed you earlier, but now they've been combined with these blocks to uh, make these concentric rings here. Um, and uh, so there's a very powerful way now of building with proteins that takes a lot of the complexity away because you can do you can basically design proteins with by simple inspection. Okay, so so far I've talked about the design of proteins um, that are have single low energy states that carry out the function we've designed. Um, uh, and so um, uh, uh, Florian and Phil have developed this uh, uh, developed the general approach to design proteins uh, which have two distinct states and which switch between those states when a peptide is bound and, or, or some other effector. And uh, that's illustrated here. So you have an equilibrium between two states, then it's driven to one of those states uh, when an effector is bound. Um, and so here's some experimental data showing how this works. There, here's the protein in one state, the protein in the other state with, um, uh, and here are two, two spin label probes. And what you can see is when the effector is added, the uh, the two, um, uh, the two probes come close together. And so and that's what you actually see here. So this is in the absence of the peptide. This is using Deere spectroscopy, which measures the distance distribution between these. And here are now crystal structures of the protein in one state or in the other state. And to get it to go into this state, we, uh, we um, uh, or Phil adds the peptide. And uh, so, um, so this is, this is sort, of the, the sort of the achievement of the goal, like a protein with two different states and which state it's in depends on the environmental conditions. Now, Arvin Pillai will, will um, decide to take advantage of these to design um, uh, to design allosterically controlled uh, oligomers. And so here we have one of those proteins here, that hinge protein, and as this is sort of a schematized representation, here's the effector and it causes it to bend. And um, uh, so we can imagine if we design interfaces between the ends here, in one arrangement, we could have this one form a square. When this binds, it, the, these things bend. And so now this interface 
things come together at a different angle. And so in this schematic picture, it generates a triangle. Well, Arvind has been able to do this um, very successfully. So here is a here are designs uh, with the peptide. Um, the, um, and you can see they form these beautiful square-like structures. In the absence of the peptide, the angles are such that it instead forms um, a, a, th a three-mer uh, that's a triangle shape. And here's one that, in the absence of the peptide, has four sides. It's got four copies. And then when the peptide's added and the hinge motion changes, it forms this uh, pentameric structure. Um, so those are the things that um, we can do using, uh, we've done primarily using Rosetta, although um, the, uh, a lot of the sequence design and the more recent designs I showed you um, uh, is actually done using deep learning methods. And so now I'm gonna, so the rest of my talk, I'm gonna show you the sorts of things we've been doing using deep learning. So one of the first things we tried was using reinforcement learning, basically Monte Carlo tree search to try and design monomers that had properties that were, um, uh, uh, that were compatible with some overall uh, design goal. And uh, the, the basic idea is, and I'll, I'll, um, is, is illustrated, this is one of the examples on the right here. Suppose you want to make a small protein that has just the right shape to form an icosahedron. Um, well, what Isaac uh, Lutz did was to develop Monte Carlo tree search where you basically go through and you build up the icosahedron and you, you, you go up and down in the search graph um, favoring uh, choices. Um, so these things are being built up by successive addition of small fragments, helical fragments, um, and you favor additions which give you better closure and lower porosity in this case. Um, and so what this enabled is, um, what this eventually led to in this case was a very small protein, only 55 amino acids, which um, has a shape which is perfectly um, uh, compatible uh, makes this perfectly closed icosahedron, and um, this is the uh, the cryoEM structure, and it's nearly identical to the design model. So this was sort of a first way of of, um, kind of using simple reinforcement learning to optimize uh, 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 to to basically design from scratch a protein which had the sort of global property of being able to assemble into an icosahedron. So. Um, Everything I'm going to tell you about from now on has, is, is basically the result of training models on the protein structure data bank, which, of course, is, is an enormous resource. There are many hundreds of thousands of protein structures, and they're not only structures of proteins alone, they're bound to nucleic acids and bound to small molecules. So over the last year or two, we've trained um, a variety of models for different tasks using this as a resource. So... Um, uh, after um, DeepMind announced, uh, described their uh, remarkable results um, with uh, AlphaFold at, uh, at the CASP um, meeting, um, we weren't, it wasn't clear at that point, you know, if they were going to make the code available or, you know, whether it was going to become accessible. So we were kind of, we were, um, uh, you know, we wanted to understand how, to, you know, to, to, to sort of play around with some of the, uh, the concepts that, that they introduced. And so we developed Rosetta Fold. Um, and the major difference between Rosetta Fold is, um, well, there are a number of differences. It has a, a third track, which is a 3D coordinate track, um, which is handled by an SE3 transformer. There's no uh, invariant point attention IPA, um, and there's no triangle attention. Um, you know, we didn't, the, the, when we developed this, all, all the, 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 the ideas that we had, um, the ideas that they introduced, the, the primary one was really the idea of having uh, the, having um, a two tracks that would share information. And, you know, and, and so we added this third track. So a neat thing now is that um, this uh, train model uh, perform has pretty much the same performance as um, AlphaFold um, on an independent test set. And, you know, I think in a sense, this isn't surprising. We, I mean, we, you know, AlphaFold was developed it was definitely developed first, but I think what what this tells you is, you know, there's there are a, and there, there's a bar, wide variety of architectures which can likely solve this problem. And so we um, when we developed Rosetta Fold, of course, we didn't know anything about how AlphaFold was constructed. So uh, as I said earlier, we didn't have IPA, we didn't have triangle attention. Um, the first version of, of Rosetta Fold was not as as uh, accurate as AlphaFold, and we found that. Uh, in, including um, uh, changing the loss to, to fate, which is this frame oriented, frame oriented or frame orientation based loss, helped enormously. So I think that was like that was really a 
uh, uh, an important thing that the AlphaFold team introduced. It's pretty simple. It's just a measure of calculating error, but it really made a difference. Um, we had experimented with pretty simple procedures for um, feeding information back through the network, um, but uh, not to the extent that the AlphaFold team did. And when we introduced recycling, it worked really well. So one of the neat things is that we have a single model now that works as well as AlphaFold on monomers and as well as uh, AlphaFold multimer on complexes. But more interestingly, we've gone beyond now to incorporate, uh, go beyond proteins. Um, and so Frank DeMaio is um, basically incorporated, basically just expanded the, the alphabet to, um, to DNA bases in addition to um, uh, protein amino acids. And in doing so, he's, he's been able to create a version of Rosetta Fold or and now it's this, the, the latest Rosetta fold can predict um, uh, not only the structures of proteins, but also the structures of protein nucleic acid complexes. Frank's also extended Rosetta fold to be able to handle uh, symmetry explicitly. So if you have a really large complex, um, you can just give it one subunit and specify the, the, the symmetry and rather than having to model the whole system. Um, so uh, Rohith, um, Jin and uh, Ju Wang have extended Rosetta Fold um, to really to be able to model, to be able to incorporate any arbitrary um, uh, uh, collection of atoms in addition to amino acid residues. And uh, so small molecules, um, covalent modifications or, or whatever. And um, so basically represent, and so their training set essentially here now is the whole PDB and whatever happens to be in those PDB structures. And um, so it's, it's, it's really kind of neat looking at how well this does for covalent modifications. So here, for example, is a sugar group comparing the predicted structure to the actual structure. Um, and uh, it is obviously easier to predict the structures of things which are covalently attached than, than free ligands. Um, so uh, this is all gonna be important in, in just a minute when I start talking about design. So the bottom line is we have a version of Rosetta Fold that now can model any biomolecular system comparing con containing different types of biomolecules and small molecules. Um, and so uh, I, this, is, this is kind of old news, but Eustace Dubras um, last year developed uh, really building on work at, um, at MIT, work that John Ingram did, um, uh, this, um, uh, uh, this um, uh, message passing neural network for basically solving the problem of going from a, uh, um, a protein backbone structure to uh, a sequence. Um, and now uh, Eustace has incorporated, has generalized this so that now you can incorporate not just protein, but also uh, DNA and small molecules. So, so that means we now have ways of predicting general protein system, general uh, macromolecular systems, as well as given a backbone designing them. Um, and so now I'm going to show you what sort of things we can do with these tools. Oh, sorry. This is just first an illustration of so this is data from Eustace comparing the, the sequence recovery, so if you have a protein, you have a small molecule bound, how much better do you do at predicting what the actual native amino acids are when you have the ligand present using this uh, ligand MPNN version compared to the protein MPNN version? And you can see you do very much better. Um, it's not surprising because you're using, um, you have, you, you're using this additional information. And this is the same thing uh, when you have DNA information available. Um, so, okay, so now how can we use this? Um, well, this is um, these these uh, these are these pictures show these show giant rings that were designed um, using one of our earlier approaches. Um, uh, basically, uh, it's essentially expectation maximization or activation maximization, um, what we call hallucination, where you basically just start with a random sequence and you optimize it, uh, putting it through a network like Rosetta Fold or AlphaFold at each stage, and you optimize the sequence to fold to the type of structure you want which in this case were these very large rings. And these cryo-EM structures really beautifully show that these rings um, came out properly. So uh, uh, Lena Ann had, had this idea of, of using this approach to make um, what she calls pseudocycles, which have these central pores in the middle, and to use those as binding scaffolds for, uh, for small molecules. And we can, so she generates the backbones using this hallucination process um, has a very large number of these. And then she docks, takes her, the ligand she wants to design binders to, docks it in, and then designs the, um, the surrounding residues uh, for binding using the ligand MPNN. And this just shows a crystal structure of one of her first designs made this way. And so the cool thing is we can now really design shape complementary scaffolds. And so we can extend this idea to, um, to enzymes. And uh, so Andy and Chris 
set out to make um, new luciferases. And the way they did this was to design a pocket, design proteins that had pockets that were complementary to um, uh, this um, rate limiting species uh, in this uh, luciferase reaction. So in the luciferase reaction, light is released. Um, and so here in the end is um, uh, the design protein. This was actually done before we had the ligand MTNN. So Andy used uh, Rosetta for it. So we can see that we get a very close complementary pocket. And, um, uh, and then uh, what's neat about these is the, um, the, uh, some of the designs that Andy made were very active. And again, luciferase is, uh, um, result in uh, emission of light. And um, uh, that's shown here. Um, and some of these are quite respectable enzymes, uh, higher in activity than, than enzymes we had been able to design using previous non-ML methods. And um, again, because of the shape complementary pocket, uh, the design luciferase, which is shown here, is very specific. It only acts on the intended substrate, whereas naturally occurring luciferases have, um, they have much more open pockets, so they tend to be much less specific. So if you want to say multiplex uh, reporters, it's nice to have a series of enzymes that are individually specific for their, uh, for their substrates. Um, okay, so um, the first way, the so we wanted generative models to actually uh, to design both backbones and uh, sequences for given functions. And that were a little bit more direct than this activation maximization approach, um, the hallucination approach. So the first way we set about to do this was to um, uh, what we called in-painting, uh, or sort of it's kind of obviously an in-painting approach. So to take, so Rosetta Fold was originally trained uh, to go from uh, sequences to structures, but instead we trained it by deleting region portions of sequence and structure, and then training it to fill those uh, missing regions in. So this is essentially, uh, uh, like autocomplete missing information recovery uh, for both protein sequence and structure. So it's more than a, a protein sequence language model because it's filling in the structure at the same time it's filling in the sequence. Or you can just train it to fill in missing structure. And um, <clears throat> there are um, there are, uh, quite a few things that we've been able to do with this that I'm going to gloss over, except for this one example where um, here, um, Joe Watson, who developed, developed, Joe and David developed this method, um, uh, picked three, um, three sort of structure and sequence motifs from respiratory syncytial virus, which is shown here, the whole uh, coat protein. And I tried to build these into single proteins, and they're shown here. And uh, the idea was to make a small protein that would be very immunogenic and list antibodies against all different part, all different sides of the, of the viral protein. And so what's neat about these proteins is they actually bind all three viruses, all three anti antibodies that recognize all three sites. Okay, so the um, uh, one of the, the, the limitation of this um, in painting approach, well, there were two, there were two limitations. Um, one is, I'll just go go back to here. Uh, one is that um, uh, it's deterministic. So you, you, you fill everything in in one pass through the network. So uh, you don't get uh, variation. And in most design scenarios, you want to have many possibilities. So you can have many shots on goal. Um, the other problem is that this, um, uh, this in-painting approach starts failing when you, have, um, when you have very little starting information. And so this, uh, this of course, led us to uh, diffusive, diffusion models where we get around both problems because we can start with um, uh, we start with random noise and every trajectory that we, every, um, you know, every noise distribution gives rise to a different solution to the problem. And um, also we don't have to provide any, the, the amount of starting information that is required is very, very small. So, um, uh, so RF diffusion was trained by taking uh, the entire PDB, uh, noising structures to different extents, and then Fine-tuning Rosetta Fold uh, to recover the uh, the to predict the um, the actual structure. And so one of the insights here is that you know the the real the real trick in diffusion models is how do you do the denoising. And the insight here was that we'd already trained Rosetta Fold uh, to do the very difficult task of of structure prediction, basically go from no information to the final structure or no structural information. Um, and so it was not. And then the in-painting approach we trained. Uh, to we trained Rosetta Fold in that case to go from partial structural information to, to complete structural information. So it really wasn't a much of a leap to fine tune it to go from no, a noise structure, noise to different extents to final structure. And this just shows um, uh, example trajectories 
Um, and uh, so, and then basically what we do is we predict the, the, the ground truth structure, the t equals zero, the x zero structure at each stage um, uh, using Rosetta Fold. And then we take a small step in that direction and uh, basically denoise in that way. And you can see how the, the um, how the, the the structure, the predicted structure, predicted X zero structure starts resembling more and more of the final structure. Um, and so this works quite well. We can design uh, structures um, up to uh, quite quite large sizes and the sequences that come out after MPNN are um, are very close to the um, to the diffuse structures. And um, uh, so we can also do this in sequence space using Rosetta fold. So we're still modeling sequence and structure. But in this case, what we're diffusing is the sequence. So at each step, we have um, uh, we have the sequence and a partial and whatever structural constraints we have, we run it through Rosetta Fold to generate uh, new, a new sequence and take a step in that direction. So again, it's um, it's a very much building on that in painting where we where Rosetta Fold was recovering sequence information as well as structure information. So this is what uh, a representative trajectory looks like. In this case, we have um, uh, we have uh, uh, the blurred out sequence, and then it becomes more and more. Um, uh, uh, oops, sorry. It um, it settles down on a at the end on a very defined sequence. The neat thing about this is that we can bias it with sequence based um, uh, uh, measures. So, for example, we can say we want sequences proteins that are enriched in cysteines or in tryptophans, and um, and the diffusion process. Uh, and uh, will produce proteins like that. Or, or if we take um, for enzymes that we're designing in the lab, we can have we have a lot of experimental data. We can uh, we can basically build a predictor of activity based on that data and use that to guide the process. So we're trying that as well. So the sequence-based diffusion has some nice properties uh, for for some for for some classes of problems. Okay, so now back back to structure-based diffusion, uh, we can. Um, uh, we can design, we can um, uh, generate not only monomeric structures, but multimeric structures. And to keep it simple, we can generate symmetric multimeric structures. So here we uh, start with a random um, uh, distribution of amino acids. And rather than just denoising that, we copy it over in this case three times um, and then uh, apply the denoising um, uh, to the uh, combined structure, symmetrizing at each step. And so uh, the nice thing about this is symmetric structures are bigger. They have multiple subunits. And so we can get structural validation by electron microscopy in a pretty straightforward way. And uh, so here are um, um, here's some examples of designs and the 3D models. And you can see that this is um, the electron microscopy. You can see they, they fit very closely. Um, and we can make even fairly exotic structures like this dihedral structure consisting of two uh, uh, tetramers on top of each other. And again, they fit very closely. And even going up to icosahedra. So here in this calculation, we just start with a single chain and say we want to make an icosahedral structure. And um, that this is basically what gets generated. Um, so in terms of, of binding functionality, this is how I began my talk and I'll end in the same way. Uh, so uh, we can take, um, take bits of, of, of chemical matter, say a peptide that are already known to bound bind to target and now sort of randomly diffuse out a structure around it. That's shown here. And uh, what we come up with are things that are, are, are proteins that when we test them experimentally can bind a thousand fold more tightly than the original peptide. Um, to do the original ta the task I described at the beginning of holding that um, antiviral protein in place, uh, we can basically do sort of constrained symmetric diffusion and <clears throat> build out, starting from random noise, a trimer that holds these in exactly the right position. We can, um, we can start with other types of symmetric functional motifs, for example, this metal binding site, and then diffuse out proteins uh, around it and that's basically illustrated here. And we end up with um, this tetramer that has, here's the structure of it by electron microscopy, and it binds metal more tightly than we can, uh, we can measure. So uh, here, the nice thing is we can match the coordination geometry, the coordination chemistry of the metal to the symmetry of the overall assembly. Um, 
And now the, the binder design problem, again, this is the one I started with, but in that case, it was using Rosetta. Here, this is now using Diffusion. We basically throw the, uh, the random, uh, this, we have this random point cloud, we put it around the target, we indicate which residues we want to bind to, and then throughout the um, trajectory, basically uh, uh, out of this noise emerges um, a binding protein. And uh, we've made binders to quite a number of targets now. Um, and uh, um, it's actually funny, you know, my whole group was uh, um, has now uh, started using these methods. So there's been a real, uh, there's been a real, um, a bit of a revolution in methods in the last, uh, the last year, actually several. Um, so we can make binders to a wide variety of targets. We have a cryo-EM structure of one of them. This is basically the influenza virus. Here is a diffused binder. And, and, and just to emphasize, all we're giving it is we're just saying, here's the structure and here's the region we want to bind to. And then the, the diffusion process basically comes up with all the rest. Um, and so you can see this design is very close to the, um, uh, uh, the cryo-EM structure is very close to the model. Um, and uh, we can um, also coming back, this is now a third method for designing peptide binding proteins to go with the Rosetta based ones I described at the beginning. Here we start with the peptide and uh, we um, and a random distribution of points around it. And so what is, so we assemble proteins that are predicted to bind the peptide. And when uh, we actually measure them experimentally, they bind uh, extraordinarily tightly to the um, to the peptides. These are actually the highest affinity binders that think have ever been designed against any target prior to experimental optimization. So these are right off the computer. And uh, just to show you what we're doing now, um, I told you we now have Rosetta Fold working for it can now um, uh, predict protein nucleic acid structures and protein small molecule structures. So now we um, have diffusion, uh, we've generalized RF diffusion to be able to build structures around, um, uh, around small molecules. This is, uh, uh, um, a villain, which is a very interesting uh, a molecule for, um, for the light harvesting application. And so you can see we get these very nice designs that just sort of assemble around the, the small molecule. And we can also keep certain, uh, the, we can, if we have an idea about catalytic mechanism, we can position uh, key catalytic residues around the small molecule and diffuse around that. And that's really how we're focusing on making new enzymes these days. So I've had, um, Really fantastic colleagues uh, doing all this uh, with all this work. Longjing and Brian uh, and Keja designed, developed the, and Nina did the work on the sort of the classic Rosetta based um, protein binder design. And Keja designed um, that trimer I showed you. Uh, the peptide binding, uh, Danny uh, developed the, um, uh, those amyloid binders I showed you. And Keja and Hua designed the, uh, those extended peptide kind of that modular recognition approach. Uh, Nate and Shunji did the work on the light harvesting systems. Uh, the protein nanopore work uh, was done by uh, Samuel and Sagardip uh, in collaboration with Anastasia and Carolyn. Uh, Zhe and Shunji and Una designed those 3D crystals. Uh, Tim and Yang designed those very regular label, label blocks like proteins that we can use to make extensible materials. The two state switches were designed by Florian and Phil and Arvind um, extended them to uh, those to, to build um, allosteric. Uh, uh, oligomers. Um, Isaac, Shunji, and Chris did the work on the reinforcement learning to make those mini icosahedra. Eustace uh, Dupras developed the protein MPNN and more recently the, the, the ligand MPNN, which has um, basically become the lab standard for, um, for sequence design. Andy and Chris uh, designed the uh, luciferase. Um, Olina An and designed the, um, used the, uh, design, designed those um, pseudocycles to bind ligands in a shape complementary manner. Uh, Andy and Chris designed the luciferase. <laughs> Rosetta Fold, work of Minky um, uh, and Frank DeMaio and Ju and Rohith have extended that now to, um, it now to very general macromolecular systems. RF diffusion has been a big collaboration between uh, many people, Joe and David, uh, Nate, uh, Brian and uh, Jason, um, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and um, it's been great to work with them. Uh, Brian's moved on, but now, uh, but Jason is a student at MIT. Um, Helen did all the work on the um, symmetric uh, assemblies. Um, uh, uh, Woody is um, extending Rosetta Fold for, um, for enzymes, small molecules, and Pritham and Susanna and um, 
Phil Leong have been uh, used um, a variety of deep learning methods to design uh, peptide binding proteins. And then I want to thank my colleagues uh, at the IPD who made a lot of this possible. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you very much, David. Do you hear me? Yeah, I do hear you. Okay, awesome. Perfect. So this is working. Okay, so questions in the room or also questions in the chat. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, super interesting with the conditional diffusion stuff. I was wondering, um, in the models that you showed, you condition on like molecular features. What do you think of the is the other prospects for building these conditional models, conditioning on functional properties of the uh, uh, of the proteins that aren't maybe directly uh, measured in uh, when you don't know the molecular things you're looking for? But you yeah, I think if you well, if you have a predictor for the property, then it's very straightforward to. Um, to use it to bias diffusion, just add the gradients of, of it to the, you know, at every step. And so that's what we're doing now. Um, for example, for the enzyme activity stuff, I showed you a simple example where, you know, a sequence is sequence um, biasing. So I think anything that you can, anything that you can produce a network to compute from either the sequence or the structure, uh, you can pretty readily incorporate into, um, into these networks. And is the quality of the design proteins that you get from that kind of approach um, as good as the ones that you get from the molecular conditioning? Well, that's a good question. We don't have um, uh, we don't have a huge amount of, of, of data on that. Um, uh, I mean, this, this, the sequence biased ones do fold. I think it would depend on how strong the constraint is. And I think the bigger problem is more likely you might be constraining your diversity. For example, one of the things we're working on is having a go function predictor. If you have a function predictor, um, but you don't want it just to sort of collapse down to the sequences on which it was trained. So I think there's quite a bit of experimentation to do there. Thank you very much. Or has a question, he's coming up as well. Um, hi, David, thanks for the nice talk. Um, going back to your uh, earlier work, uh, designing these binders against cytokine receptors and different uh, immune receptors. Have you also thought of, um, you know, designing low affinity binders because there's a lot of work showing that, um, you know, modulating the affinity can lead to different uh, receptor clustering and downstream signaling activity? Yeah, so we're doing that. We've, for, for, um, for some of the cytokine mimics, we've, um, we have, we're systematically sort of detuning them. I, I think there the challenge is just the, the biological assays you use to, uh, to measure um, uh, what you know, what how you've affected uh, the signaling process, and um, but yeah, we're 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 doing that now, and it's a little bit you know undirected because you don't know. It's, it's sort of like it's a little bit empirical, but um, that's one of the nice things about these designed agonists is they're really easy to modulate. They're, I mean, they're very you can make them at high levels and large different large numbers of different variants, so you can really explore things like that. Thank you, um, Marie. Also has a question. Hi, yeah, that was very interesting. I had a quick question about um, amyloid binders and TDP43 binders. Uh, I was wondering to what extent we can combine like, you know, uh, drug repurposing with like new drug design. Uh, for example, currently we're looking at, you know, the response um, to JAK inhibitors um, among like the uh, patients, I mean, disease patients um, under, uh, TDP43 plus versus minus profile. And so we find that certain, you know, jack inhibitors, the response is better. And we would like to understand, you know, why, uh, depending on, on the jack. And so we don't know yet, but so do you have insights how to combine like repurposing drugs and new drug design, uh, well, especially think, for amyloid and TDP43? Yeah, um, well, I think just in general, it's, I think the, the thing you run into is sort of what you were describing that one can design things that biochemically have the function you want, for example, blocking um, blocking amyloid formation or blocking a stat. But then, you know, it just gets very difficult. You know, the, the, the tests get harder and harder as you go up the biological complexity level. Um, but I think, you know, in principle, there's no reason why drugs couldn't be combined that work in different ways. I think one of the things we're, we're, we're sort of focusing on are the peripheral amyloid diseases because there, there's a little bit more direct data implicating um, the amyloid with disease. But yeah, I think the answer to your question is in principle, yes, uh, a combination could, could totally work. And 
maybe we'll test take like one more from the chat. Um, so and that is in line with Marie's question a little bit. Um, you know, like how many of these have you tested and what are potential immune responses triggered by delivering the novel proteins? Yeah, right. So I forgot to say, but this has kind of been a big year for protein design in a couple of ways, but we have our first approved medicine, which is a COVID vaccine, which is very effective and is in use in Korea. We have um, a number of medicines that are designs that are in cl human clinical trials or have been. Thus far, the immunogenicity seems to be pretty low. It hasn't been, um, it, it, you know, you might have thought that a foreign protein would elicit really strong immune responses, but um, uh, many of these have been in animals and in general, you know, you can do repeat dosing and there's no decrease in, in um, their efficacy. I think it's just because these proteins are really small and really stable and they don't elicit a strong response. Um, actually, I'm not sure, was that the question? <laughs> yeah, this was the okay. question. And yeah. also maybe how much have you optimized for that already when you were designing it, I guess. Was I think that implicit. The score? Yeah, actually that was, that's maybe an answer to a question that came up earlier about how we can guide the diffusion process. You know, any predictor of T-cell epitopes or overall immunogenicity, that's a function of sequence and structure we can incorporate. So you can imagine designing proteins favoring human sequences and disfavoring T-cell epitopes. Um, and, uh, um, but I think a lot of it just happens because, the, because of the physical properties of what we're designing, you know, just proteins to be really stable and, and um, very, you know, soluble and, and not too big means that they don't get taken up by dendritic cells very well. So, I mean, so basically the bottom line is you can put in whatever you, any, any kind of constraints you want to or any properties you can pretty easily put into the design process. And really the, the question is to what extent do you understand, um, you know, what it is that you want to optimize or can you quantify that in, in, in terms of sequence and structure? Um, and so thus far, um, Thus far, what we've been doing seems to work pretty well, but you know it'll still be important to test immunogenicity and safety of any design potential therapeutic. Awesome, thank you very much, David. So thank you from everyone here in the room and also outside on Zoom. Um, thanks for a wonderful talk. Thanks.